The Sony A7R Mark V has finally arrived. I've been using it for a couple of months and in this video I'm going to share my thoughts on it. I'm going to share those thoughts from a perspective of a landscape photographer, not a wildlife photographer and not a sports photographer or any other kind of photographer. Although I will touch briefly upon some of the features that are beneficial for other types of nature and sports photographers. And based on recent events, I just want to make it abundantly clear that just because I have a landscape photography YouTube channel, that does not make me a landscape photography gear guru or someone that you should follow one to one. Fact of the matter is that the vast majority of us landscape photographers on YouTube, we have not tried all gear. I have no clue how equivalent Nikon gear works. Most of us simply just haven't tried all of the gear. Well, unless you're James Popsies or Tom Heaton, because they seem to change their gear as the rest of us change our underwear. But as it has turned out, both of them seem to have settled on a high megapixel, full frame, lightweight gear setup, just as I've preached for years, and the main reason why I have been shooting with my A7R 3 so back when I changed from Sony to Canon, a lot of people like greeted me to the dark side. And honestly, I found it to be a little bit silly. In all honesty, when it comes to brands and camera brands, I'm very agnostic. I choose the camera brand that works the best for me. And I'm not saying that all the other brands are bad. This just works for me. There's just too much tribalism in regard to the kind of gear that you choose. Let's just, we're all adults. Can we like just have a sober conversation about these things? <laughs> I think I meant a civil conversation, but I guess let's just be sober too. So when it comes to cameras, I think it's extremely important to think of them as tools. They're not your babies, they're not your children. It's a tool that's supposed to get a job done. If it doesn't get the job done, it's not the right camera for you. So back in the days when I changed from my Canon 5DS to my A7R 3 the context was that I was traveling a lot to Iceland and I wanted to photograph quite a lot more of auroras and I wanted to do more aurora photography and a more aurora videography. So I needed a sensor that could deal with that and the Canon 5DS, despite being a 50 megapixel camera and still a really good camera, it just did not deliver on high ISOs. The A7R 3 from Sony was by far the best option. Even though Canon had made the 5D Mark IV back then, it was just like 1300 euros more expensive than the A7R 3 and it wasn't more innovative. The A7R 3 had way more that it could, could show for. So that was the main reason why I changed camera systems back then. The A7R 3 got the job done, whereas my 5DS did not. So first and foremost, the main reason why I upgrade from the A7R 3 to the A7R 5 is simply because I do not trust my A7R 3 anymore. Due to wear and tear on my hot shoe up here, it has just become very uncertain whether or not I can actually use it well in the field. As we all know by now, Sony cameras has this stupid error message that pops up each time the hot shoes get wet and it is freakingly annoying to work with and despite having gone five six years with this error Sony still have not fixed it it's so annoying so I needed a new camera that hadn't wear worn down its hot shoe another part is also that my a7r 3 got very very wet when I was in the lake district and it got so wet that I was actually in doubt about whether or not it would survive. I just needed to dry it for three, four days and it works like a charm still now. But I just don't entirely trust that it won't die on me if I go out into grim weather and photograph again. And as you probably know me, I do that quite a lot. So one of the big things I have learned over the years is that nobody cares about what camera you're photographing something with unless they are a beginner. Nobody can see the difference between a Sony A7R 3 a Canon R5 or a Nikon Z7 Mark II photo. Nobody can see the difference. And if there are any differences between these 
photo files, you can easily compensate for it in post processing. And of course you can import all these files into Photoshop and overlay them and you can see that they are of course different file size. But unless you make a massive print, let's say two by three meters or even larger, at the finest detail with the best printer in the world, you won't be able to see a difference between these photo files anyway, even though you put your nose all the way up against the print. So fact of the matter is that all newer cameras have amazing dynamic range, they have amazing amount of megapixels and they are all decently well at handling noise at high ISOs. So the image quality is just really really good. So let's talk about that for the a7R5. The a7R5 has 61 megapixels, which is about 20 megapixels more than I personally would need. Now the benefit of 61 megapixels is not the increased sharpness, because sharpness comes down to the lens you put on top of the camera. What is beneficial with 61 megapixels is of course that you can crop in after you have taken the photo. The only thing is that for landscape photography, which is a relatively slow process, you should not generally have any problem with finding the proper focal length for your photo before you actually hit the shutter. Now when it comes to wildlife photography and sports photography, it's a completely other story. Then yes, it's very beneficial to have a high megapixel camera, but for landscape photography, eh, 61 megapixels in the a7R5 was definitely not the reason why I got this camera. So as mentioned, it comes down to the lenses you put on top of the camera, whether you can benefit from the 61 megapixels. The only problem is that getting really, really sharp lenses usually comes with a cost, which is money. The downside to 61 megapixel files, which is actually quite a big downside, is that they become very, very heavy and it requires a computer with a decent amount of processing power to actually process these photos. And it requires the editing programs to actually work and don't fill up your memory in your computer as soon as you just like open the library of the files of the A7R5. And obviously when the camera do offer 61 megapixels, you don't use the medium or low raw profiles, which is 26 and 15 megapixels. Nobody does that. <laughs> so when it comes to the image quality of the A7R5, it's great, it's good, it's fine. And if there's anything lacking, you can easily compensate for it with some editing. In the end, when it comes to images and image quality, it is so much more important what you put yourself in front, what you put in front of the camera more than that it is a 61 megapixel camera. So if you want to learn more about editing your landscape photos, be sure to enroll in my huge Photoshop for landscape photographers post-processing course. Here I cover all the techniques I use to create my high dynamic, epic landscape photos and also my more atmospheric and moody photos. I'm covering everything from getting into the programs, learning Photoshop without panicking about panels disappearing. I'm going to teach you how to use masking, use luminosity masking, focus stacking, how to clean your photos, how to sharpen your photos, how to blend layers in many different ways, and how to use all the different tools that I use to make my photos pop. So if you want to save a little bit of money, there is a coupon code with the link in the description of this video. So no matter the camera brand, no matter the amount of megapixels and image quality, what gets you the good photos is that you put yourself in front of beautiful and interesting scenes. Now, besides, of course, the image quality, which is debatable, there are a lot of functions in this camera that I've been looking forward to and that are amazing for us landscape photographers. First and foremost, as this is a mirrorless camera, it's quite small. It doesn't have a mirror inside of it like the DSLR cameras have. Makes it smaller, it's great. The downside to mirrorless cameras is that they just attract a lot of dust onto the sensor. The sensor is exposed when you take off the lens. However, with the new A7R5, Sony has finally actually made sure that the sensor is protected by the shutter when you take off the lens. So in that way, when you change the lenses, we don't get all the dust in the air onto the sensor. 
One thing to be aware of is that it only shuts down if you are in the non-silent mode of the camera settings. You can change to silent mode and not silent shutter mode inside the camera, but it only works if you are not in silent shutter mode. So a very beneficial thing for landscape photographers that Sony has finally implemented in the a7R5 is focus bracketing or focus stacking. So you can do it automatically within the camera so you don't have to do it manually, press the screen, change the focus and so forth. So now you simply just go into the menu of focus bracketing and here you can set the step width and you can set the number of shots that you want to take. And I'm not sure if there's actually any math behind these things. I guess there is. <laughs> For me, it works right now with eight as a step width and 17 shots. And the good thing is when the camera has figured out that it has covered the entire focus width of your scene, then it just stops. So even though I've set it to 17 shots, it just stops at eight. So even though focus stacking is still a cumbersome process when it comes to processing the focus stacked files, they have made it easier to actually focus stack in the field. Admittedly, I also have had some issues with my camera not being able to focus stack no matter what lens I've tried. For now, my 20 mm f1.8 seems to work. The new 16 to 35 mm seems to work. I haven't checked some of the other lenses right now, but <laughs> right now my camera works. I don't know why it didn't work a couple of weeks ago because I'm not sure I have updated the firmware, but uh, there you go, it seems to work. <laughs> Now another big thing with the a7R5 is that it should have a greatly increased image stabilization built into the camera house. So no matter if you're using a lens with image stabilization in it or one without, it should be able to compensate up to eight stops of light. I'm not sure that's possible. And even though you're shooting with a wide angle lens, for the most part, I would probably recommend you not to handhold it with a shutter speed lower than one tenth of a second. Maybe down to one eighth of a second or something like that, but you're probably pushing it there. So long lens on, shooting birds and so forth, I guess it's good. But for landscape photography, you're probably going to use a tripod anyway. And I would recommend to do that for the most part if you're trying to make high quality fine art photography. And with a 61 megapixel camera, you really need something that compensates a lot for, lot for all those micro shakes. But um, I'm looking forward to see if the image stabilization in this camera is actually making a big difference for my photography. So the resolution of the monitor and the resolution of the viewfinder when you look through it had also been greatly upgraded, especially since the a7R 3 But when it comes to the monitor, there is one thing above everything that is probably the biggest selling point of the A7R5. And that is this fully articulating, flippy, floppy screen that can both tilt like this, flip out and be used like crazy people like me who film myself, just as I do with the A7C and I'm looking right now at the screen. And of course, you can use it, if I can just figure this out, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> you can use it in vertical mode, which is fantastic. This is what I've been asking for for so many years. And that we even still have the tilt function in it. It's just, <laughs> thank you, Sony. Oh my God. Now the irony is, of course, that all my favorite photos of last year has basically all been horizontal, but I, I guess that's, something else we can talk about in another video. But this flippy, floppy, fully articulating, tilting screen out over the entire thing. <laughs> yes. Another thing that is hugely beneficial to us landscape photographers is that we now have a fully manual bulb function that we can actually use, set the time we want the shutter to be open for. Let's say one minute. 120 seconds, 240 seconds, and so forth. So we don't have to stand with our watches or our phones or our remote shutters and so forth and wait for the camera to be done. The camera will do it all automatically now for us as long as we just set in 
the timer for the bulb. But one thing to be aware of is that you cannot do bulb mode function in silent shooting. And you also need to put your camera into manual mode. So manual mode and your camera cannot be in silent shooting mode if you want to benefit from the bulb function. So as I mentioned to begin with, one of the main reasons why I kind of needed to upgrade the camera was because I didn't trust it perfectly. So it is good that the A7R5 has upgraded its weather sealing, at least compared to the A7R3. I'm not so sure it is better than the A7R4, but it's better for me, which is good. Another thing is that I have bought my first piece of Nikon gear ever, which is this little hot shoe protector there on top. So you simply just take it off and slide it in because the one that comes with Sony is just too small and it never protected my A7R 3 So hopefully this one here with a little bit of rubber on top will do a better job at that. We also need to talk about another thing that is hugely beneficial to the Sony system and that is all the third party lenses. Here we talk Sigma and we talk Tamron, we talk Lauva, we talk a lot of different lens manufacturers who actually make lenses for the A7 system from Sony. Now, I have heard, I'm not sure it's confirmed yet, but Canon is shutting down or making sure that Tamron is not able to make third-party lenses to the Canon R series of cameras. For me, that is not just a huge blunder, that is... <laughs> Yeah, my liberal heart cries when it comes to this. But luckily that is not the case for Sony. Sony still has their A7R series open for third-party lens manufacturers, which of course increases the competition between Sony and those lens manufacturers because Tamron and Sigma make some great lenses for this system especially that new Tamron 50 to 400 millimeter. Ooh, I have my eyes on that. But it is very important to remember that when you choose your camera system, how many lenses are available and what do you actually need. And speaking of gear, the L bracket, very, very important piece of accessory for any camera, I would argue, especially for landscape photographers. Right now, I am still using the L bracket that I have bought for my A7R 3 It works for the A7R 5 This is the one from Smallrig. But as you can see here with this L bracket, it is hard for me to get in to all the inputs of the camera, the USB inputs and the microphone inputs and so forth. So that is the downside to this one. L bracket right here. It is important that you do get an L bracket that is specifically designed to your camera if you want to benefit from all the different things that are on your camera. Especially me as a video creator. If you only do photography with this one here, it's probably of less importance. So a thing that people have been crying about for years is that the Sony menu system was a little bit lackluster and it was hard to figure out and find out where everything was. Well, they have made a new system, but in all honesty, I don't think it's particularly better than the old one. What I still do is that I go in, figure out what I want, and then I simply just add it to the favorites menu. And you can see up here, I have my interval shooting for photographing myself from a distance, whether I want to use the finder monitor, my monitor brightness, steady shoot, my audio recording levels, that's important for me as I make video, and my silent shooting mode. It is now also possible to use the screen as a touch screen. You just enable it in the menu system and then you just go in and click on whatever you need to do and you can swipe up and down and so forth. It is basically only down here in the settings. You still can't do that, but at least you can touch the screen and figure out or change where you want to focus. But for settings, you still need to dial them in with the dials as per always. So one thing that is also very important to talk about when it comes to the A7R5, because a lot of people talk about it on YouTube that now finally we can use pixel shift as landscape photographers. So pixel shift photography is basically that you put in 
the sensor and then it just moves like one pixel and takes like four photos and you can stack them and get a much more detailed photo. You can even do that up to 16 photos. So you get the most amazing, crazy amount of details and so forth. You can get a 240 megapixel photo, which is super sharp. And beforehand, before the A7R5, when you stitched them, everything that moved in the scene just made some weird artifacts. Now, however, you can stitch them and somehow the software figures out that those artifacts shouldn't be there, so you actually get a usable photo and that is also usable for landscape photographers. Or so they say. I've already argued why 61 megapixels is more than sufficient for the vast majority of landscape photographers. So 240 megapixels in a 2.2 gigabyte files compared to 70 megabyte compressed raw files is just no. <laughs> it makes no sense. The problem with pixel shift is still that if you go for the big one, let's say 16 photos, you have to take 16 photos. Birds are flying in and out, uh, waterfalls are moving, the dynamic range of the scene is still massive. Let's say you're shooting into the sunset and you need to bracket your photo, then you also need to bracket that pixel shift photo. And again, you shouldn't move the camera, so you have to make sure that you change your settings without touching your camera. And obviously you don't want to make pixel shift photos on every single scene that you're taking a photo of, because it's just filling up your memory card way too fast, even though you have a big memory card. When it comes to landscape photography, at the very least how I do landscape photography, it is very much run and gun mode. I am not working slow as a lot of landscape photographers are. And if you are and you set up your camera and you're sure this is the only one photo you're taking today, you're going home and you have made a masterpiece, well then yes, maybe you can somehow benefit from those 240 megapixels. But in the way I do landscape photography, where I try to make sure that I actually get some really, really good photos, but I have to take a lot of photos to get that one good photo. Pixel shift, whether it works or not, are simply just not beneficial for me at all. And honestly, for me, I could definitely do without. I do not think it's a selling point for landscape photographers when it comes to the A7R 5. But that's just my humble opinion. Obviously, it's always good to have the option and it may work for someone who's making some stills photography or something like that and really need to make a massive print. But for me, meh. And one of the biggest selling points for the A7R5 is that it has a greatly upgraded autofocus system that is really great at focusing and attaching to the eye and birds and eyes of birds and animals and trains and planes and so forth, which is completely irrelevant for me as a landscape photographer, but it is supposedly really good. I have yet to find a reason to use it, but maybe one day if I want to photograph some birds or whatever, it may work great for me. So even though the Sony a7R5 is also a great video camera, it does come with a few downsides and a few disappointments, but let's just stick with landscape photography for this video. It is a fantastic landscape photography camera. On the one hand, it does everything that we've ever asked for, what we've ever wanted of a landscape photography camera. But on the other hand, it's also a little bit underwhelming because it's not really adding anything that would make me feel that I take better photos. It has just added all the features that we have ever asked for. So it is the best possible camera I can think of and come up with. There's not really anything where I really feel from a photography perspective that they can do a whole lot better. And I guess in the end, that does make this a good review, but I am still a little bit like, yeah, well, it's still up to me to take good photos. <laughs> the camera doesn't do it for me, but it has enabled me to take a few photos a little bit easier than with my A7R 3 
If you want to learn even more about composition in landscape photography, if you want to up your landscape photography editing skills, be sure to check out the links in the description of this video. As always, I would also highly appreciate a like. And of course, let me know down in the comments whether or not this camera is something for you.